in there. They just don't point it out in Christianity. Um, so the, from my point of view, I, I don't think this is where I may differ from some of my colleagues. I, I don't think the word atheism ultimately is, is necessary or even useful. And I think it's actually, uh, in the end, harmful. Uh, because it, it uh, re the rejection of absurdity is much bigger than atheism. I mean, it, it is science. You know, it, reason is much bigger than atheism. And uh, having standards of evidence and argument is much bigger than atheism. And, and that's all we need to repudiate most of what, peop what most people do most of the time in the name of, of religion. I mean, really, uh, on my uh, account, relig religious faith is really the permission people give one another to believe things strongly without evidence. And we recognize that to be pathological in every other area of our lives. We just we simply have been lulled into thinking that the, the game must change when you talk about meaning and values and morality and what happens after death. And I think that is, uh, we're paying the price for that in, in rather astonishing ways. Yeah, you said a, a belief is a lever that once pulled, leather lever that once pulled moves almost everything else in a person's life. I, so insofar as it's actually believed, yeah. <coughs> yeah. I mean, there, there, and this is, a, again, there, there's a difference between professing a belief and really believing what you profess. And, and, and we have to acknowledge that. I mean, the, the, the poll results that, that are almost all we have to go on are astonishing, the fact that, that 71% of Americans believe Satan literally exists and, and leads people to sin. Uh, the, the similar number thinks Jesus is going to return physically uh, and um, rapture all the good people. The, the fact that it can't be that 71% really, really believe these things, uh, but some significant percentage do. And so, the, But the distance between what people profess and what actually moves them moment to moment in their lives um, we just have to acknowledge that it's there, and we're more concerned about the people who, who really are making decisions on the basis of a notion that prayer works, for instance. I mean, you take the, the, the current uh, uh, nominee for the vice presidency on, on the Republican ticket, Sarah Palin. You know, what, just what does she believe about the efficacy of prayer? Uh, it really matters. If she believes that it works on any level, that seems to me to be a bad thing when it comes time to decide when to go to war or not to go to war. Uh, and I think many, Ameri many, many Americans clearly believe that it works on some level. And, and we know a lot about the way they, they cherry pick evidence uh, and the kinds of selection biases that allow them to, in their own lives and in reading the newspaper, come to believe that prayer is working. Um, but we know it doesn't work. You know, the, you know, Hurricane Katrina came in and wiped out uh, a community, 90% of whom believe in the power of prayer. And after this devastation, people were polled asking whether this only confirmed their belief in God. Uh, and 89% of people said their belief in God went up as a result. So it, 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 it's, a, um, it's a kind of credence uh, that is so elastic it, it, it's, it, it, it will suffer any possible collision with reality uh, if we don't point these, these contradictions out. And that's, that's really the problem that worries me the most, is that even people who don't believe these things have been collaborating in this conspiracy to keep people living and speaking and reasoning as though all of these beliefs were justified. Um, and so we have atheist scientists keeping uh, religious people safe in their, their, their sanctum sanctorum of, of, of wishful thinking uh, because they think everyone else needs this stuff. You know, I, the atheist scientists, don't need this stuff. But these poor people, they've got nothing else. Uh, most, to my mind, most scientists actually espouse a view like that, whether or not they have any religious beliefs themselves. And it's... It's profoundly condescending and, and unimaginative. And it's actually uh, uh, coming at quite a cost to us, I think, culturally. So what about the issue of religious scientists, then? Well, it's one thing to, to acknowledge, and this is um, 
part of the power of cultural context is that it's almost uniquely an American problem. I mean, if you look at the if you look at the rates of belief among scientists in the U.S. versus the U.K., they're skewed by this basically the the American propensity uh, for religious belief to a, to a great degree. Uh, it's it's also worth pointing out that science, re even in America, really does knock down religious belief uh, considerably. I mean, we have 90% of people uh, believing in God in the general population and 40% of scientists. Um, and depending on what your scientific specialization is, it, it gets knocked down further. Uh, doctors, 60% of doctors uh, believe in, in God uh, of some form. Uh, and I think that's, it's not an accident that doctors are the most full of faith because the doctors are having to deal with, with people who are dying, who are confronting their mortality in the context of their own faith. And it's, it's, um, it's got to be easier in some way emotionally to meet them in that language game uh, in some way that's appro that seems appropriate to their uh, circumstance. And that's, you know, that, the burden is upon the secular reasonable person uh, the atheist, to find a way of, of dealing with those moments, so, you know, the, you know, the, a moment of, of uh, uh, someone dying in a hospital, say, uh, with, without uh, repudiating um, something that's actually necessary for us to, to uh, get through that in, 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 a, in a way that is optimal for human well-being. So, I mean, you know, the, the debates you've had with people like Francis Collins and so on and so forth. Who I actually haven't debated him. The, uh, Richard did, but we've, we've collided in, in print, but I've actually never met him. Oh, okay, yeah. but you have exchanged views in print, right? Uh, I have uh, uh, given him a tongue lashing and he didn't respond, so, oh. so it was hardly an exchange. Well, that's very uh, Christian of him, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, so, but it, 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 you've heard this criticism all the time. Why just not use a little strategic humility, just let them be fine, the moderates are right. fine, they're not doing any damage, they just go to church, they sing some songs, it's a nice place to go on a Sunday. Um, why, do, why, why the, what people would call the sort of smug, elitist, aggressive campaign right. to make these people, people feel uncomfortable at the same time? Well, a few reasons. One is everyone else is, is playing that game of good cop. You know, everyone else is, is handling these, these overtly crazy ideas uh, with, with kid gloves and, and giving religious, the religious commitments of their neighbors a, a very wide uh, berth. And uh, that has gotten us to where we are now. Um, I, I actually recognize the role for the, uh, kind of a good cop, bad cop role. Uh, I think, uh, for instance, Dan Dennett doesn't make the same noises I make, and he's, he's much more of a, a good cop in this context. And he's able to say certain things that, that uh, I can't say. And you know, the, the op-ed page of the New York Times will publish his repudiation of, of uh, intelligent design. Uh, under some duress, uh, but they won't publish me on that subject, and, and you know, so there's there's a utility in that approach. Um, but I think, frankly, it's ultimately it's intellectually dishonest to not uh, not acknowledge the, the the causal linkages here between what people believe and certain actions. Um, and, I mean, for instance. You know the jihadi who who uh, blows himself up uh, in a pizza parlor or on an airplane, uh, and we have his his video, uh, and in, in his suicide video he is espousing his certainty of of getting to paradise and the seventy two virgins and all the rest, um, and we have surveillance tapes of his behavior for the months preceding his his uh, martyrdom operation, and we know that he is as devout a Muslim as you can find, and that he, that he was spending all his time in the mosque and listening to tapes of radical imams, et cetera, et cetera. We know so much about the character of this person's mind, right, to then come away from that experience and say, well, this isn't really Islam. You know, this is a, a perversion of a great faith. Um, uh, it's, 
one, it's, it's not intellectually honest. Two, it's, it's not equipping us with uh, the, the facts we need to actually make the kinds of decisions we need to make to, to protect ourselves. Now, the, the problem of Islam is, is sort of uniquely difficult, I would say, and there may in fact be a role uh, for some intellectual dishonesty, I mean, strategic intellectual dishonesty, to pretend that it is better than it is in certain circumstances. Um, and I, I acknowledge that, but someone has to call a spade a spade. Uh, otherwise, we're just, uh, you know, we are being spun, and we're not addressing actually the causes uh, of, of uh, in this case, terrorism. Um, uh, you know, domestically, that religion is playing uh, a role in almost every uh, public pol policy decision we have to make. Uh, in terms of how we allocate our resources, the kinds of claims upon, um, you know, just the kinds of wars we fight, the kinds of people we promote to positions of power, but the fact that you can't possibly get elected without pretending to believe in the God, God of Abraham uh, if you don't, or believing in the God of Abraham if you do. I mean, you, if, you, if you openly doubt that one of our books was dictated by the creator of the universe, uh, that's the end of your political career in this country. That in and of itself is having a, a, a terrible effect on our national discourse and on the kinds of people who we promote to the greatest responsibility in, in human history. Okay, so you're, in a, you're in, a, in, a, in a somewhat privileged position now in the sense that you actually are putting some science to use in working on the doctorate and so on. Mm -hmm. What would you be able to say to somebody like Sarah Palin or anybody about where you, what you think are the, the lineaments of and the, the sources of belief and, and her sense that prayer is e efficacious and so on and so forth? Well, I, that might be setting the bar rather high. I, I don't think there's anything coming out of the lab that is gonna convince someone like Sarah Palin that her faith is an error. I mean, you, you, the problem is much worse than, than that because you know, I, I debate physicists who are uh, uh, Bible-beating Christians. I mean, it's, 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 it's quite possible to have a, a, a thorough grounding in science and to not feel that, that the last 500 years of, of uh, uh, human inquiry has put your basic religious beliefs in, in check. Well, let me just interject that. I, I could understand that with physics, actually. Right. I mean, I could understand somebody uh, at the Unbelief conferences have asked people if they could explain to me, really good Nobel prize winning physicists if they could explain what John Stuart Bell's non-locality theorem means and whether David Bohm had any sense and whether there is an undivided universe and is there some sort of physics equivalent of a Spinozistic everything connectedness right. that you probably experienced when you were doing MDMA. Um, and I, I can't get an answer from them. So it's, it's, it's fairly easy, I think, still at this point to scurry into a corner of physics but, but in that corner, also believe that Jesus was the Son of God, raised from the dead, and will be returning to earth. And the, the, the hook, line, and sinker of Christianity. Uh, I get those emails all the time. I've gotten an email from, uh, from a biophysicist, a, a graduate student in biophysics, who was at a conference and in a room with three other physicists, PhD physicists, and he was the only one in the room who didn't believe that Christ was the risen Lord. Uh, I mean, this is, it is, this I would think is a uniquely American uh, uh, predicament, but it is possible, and it's, it's not an accident that it's possible uh, to, to come, get put into the machine of a PhD program and come out the other side with your ridiculous religious ideas intact, because it is considered uncivil ever to uh, put them in, in play. Uh, in, in the process of getting a scientific education. You can't, you can't, uh, I mean, part of it is a problem of specialization. I mean, you can specialize in such a way that, that uh, your, your in, the intellectual endeavor of becoming a, a first-rate scientist in your area of specialization doesn't really have implications for the rest of what you believe, you know, politically, socially, and in fact, religiously. Um, but uh, it seems to me that we could have a, an education, uh, an educational system that really um, committed people to a, a type of intellectual honesty that we really do not have in the 